The following interview was conducted with John A. Edwardson, class of 1971 in industrial engineering and a member of the Board of Trustees from 1995 to 2005 for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, October the 12th, 2010 in Stewart Center. It was a phone interview. And good morning, Mr. Edward John, and thank you again. Good morning, Catherine. <laughs> it's good to be here with you. Thank you. Uh, tell us a little bit about where and when you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Okay. I was born in Terre Haute, Indiana, okay. and um, uh, had a great Purdue connection when I was one day old, which I think you might find interesting. And, oh, um, yes. And I um, uh, happened, my, my mother was... Um, uh, sharing a room uh, at that time with a uh, uh, another gal, and uh, and when I was one year old, I had a visitor that I uh, met that day, and then did not see again till I was about 45 years old. Oh my goodness! And, and his name happened to be Johnny Wooden. Uh, he was coaching at Indiana State at the time, and his. Um, uh, son and daughter-in-law, I believe, were living there as well. And so uh, I met Coach Wooden at a, um, at a business meeting in about 1991 um, or 92, and um, I had heard this story, and uh, when I was shaking his hand, I said, it's good to see you again. And he looked at me very closely and he said, I really try hard to remember everyone I've ever met and I can't remember meeting you. And, and I said, well, we met on July 24th, 1949. And he looked at me like I was completely crazy and I said, what happened on July 24th or on July 23rd, 1949? And he thought for a second, he said, my first grandchild was born. I said, that's right. And your daughter-in-law and my mother shared a hospital room in Terre Haute, Indiana. And uh, <laughs> so it was, a, it was a great Purdue connection. Wonderful. And, um, what, could be, what could be better? <laughs> yeah, so I, I thought, uh, so I was born in Terre Haute, um, lived in uh, southern Illinois from the time I was four till I was 16. Okay. Uh, in a small town of 5,200 people named Carmi, C-A-R-M-I. Then I moved to Evansville, Indiana. When I was 16, finished my junior and senior year of high school there. Um, my yeah. parents were both Terre Haute natives. Um, my mother grew up on a farm, and my uh, father grew up in a very small house. Um, and both of my grandfathers began their working careers as coal miners and then moved on to other occupations um, as they grew older. Okay. Tell us a little about high school, how large, and any, uh, or, uh, your, any uh, teacher that you recall in student organizations? Okay, two high schools. Okay. Uh, first, uh, Carmi, Illinois, a small school, about 550 students, um, and uh, loved it. I was um, um, a mediocre athlete in general, but at Carmi, I was good enough to play baseball, basketball, and football, and start, and, uh, and enjoyed that a lot. Um, moved to Harrison High School in Evansville, Indiana my junior year and went from a school of uh, 540 people, as I mentioned, to a school of slightly over 2,000. Wow. And uh, so my athletic endeavors uh, slowed down quite a bit. I was a bench warmer, but um, uh, still went out for the teams. Um, good. was always a good student, uh, made National Honor Society my junior year at Harrison. Uh, was involved in addition to sports and you know in student government and um, and a number of other activities um, and uh, then when it came time to think about college uh -huh. Purdue was the only college I applied to okay. um, my father had done one year at Purdue and then left in uh, the late 1940s and I think um, uh, he wanted me to complete his Purdue engineering degree and uh, I kind of liked engineering, and I'd always liked Purdue just from hearing about it so much. And, um, and uh, so it was the only school I applied to, and fortunately, they accepted me. Wonderful. Tell us a little about uh, being at Purdue, and I know you got your degree in industrial engineering. Tell us about that. I, um, I, I thought uh, Purdue was wonderful. I had a great time at college, and um, uh, my first day, things were a little different in 1967 than they are today. I have a picture of me 
standing in front of a carry quadrangle uh, dorm, and I have two very small suitcases, um, each just barely larger than the briefcase I carry today, and I'm wearing a freshman green beanie hat. <laughs> Wonderful. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I look at this picture, and I look at the amount of clothing that I owned, and it was a good portion of it fit into those two suitcases. And now I look at the amount of, um, of things that new college students arrive at when they come to right. Purdue. It's like and moving. It's just the, the, the contrast is amazing sure. um, that it could change that much in such a short period of time. Right. Uh, and uh, we're at student organizations. And I also, you were a member of uh, Phi Gamma Delta, right? Yes, okay. I, uh, I, I pledged Phi Gamma Delta second semester um, of my freshman year. And um, uh, freshman year, I was active in student government in, in uh, Cary. And, um, and, and my big beef was that I thought we didn't have enough meat and that the portions were too small in the school <laughs> cafeteria, in the dorm cafeteria at Cary. And so I campaigned on, uh, on better quality food, which obviously <laughs> I had no influence in changing at all, even though I was on the class council. Um, got active um, in the fraternity um, and moved into the Fiji house my sophomore year at Purdue. Continued to be active um, uh, in uh, interfraternity council and was also active for a number of years in um, what's now called uh, the United Way okay. um, and, uh, and raised money. Uh, on campus to, um, you know, to help different organizations in Lafayette and West Lafayette, um, organized um, a run uh, prior to the Indiana-Purdue football game, and the Fiji House of Purdue would run uh, all the way uh, to Bloomington, and the next year the Bloomington chapter of Phi Gamma Delta ran back to West Lafayette, and this thing lasted for I think over 20 or, or 25 what? years oh, as, no, a, as a way to raise money for the United Way in both the Bloomington and, and Lafayette communities. And so a number of activities like that, I, I can remember blood drives I helped organize on right. campus and uh, different things, but, sure. um, um, but uh, really enjoyed. I was a teaching assistant for um, my junior and senior years, uh, one year for Jim Barony, who is, um, uh, was an industrial engineering professor, just retired about a year ago, and Ferdinand Limecooler, who was the head of the industrial engineering school. And um, Dr. Limecooler was a very instrumental in, um, in my career and my life. Um, I, I was working at Alcoa in, uh, in a rolling mill near Evansville, Indiana in the summers as an industrial engineer and was really debating whether it was what I wanted to do or not. And um, I talked to Dr. Leinkuhler uh, about the, the struggle I was having and, and he convinced me to complete my industrial engineering degree, which was a very important thing to do. And he be, began to talk to me about getting an MBA. And I had never even heard the term mm -hmm. what MBA um, was about. And so he was very helpful. He helped me get accepted at University of Chicago um, and at Harvard uh, with a caveat at Harvard that I had to work uh, for two years first full time and then come back to school. But um, uh, Ferd and I stayed uh, close for many years. We still see each other occasionally and, and email or talk occasionally. But uh, he was a very important person in um, helping me decide on, on uh, what kind of a career to, uh, to have and, um, and, and just has uh, been a great supportive um, individual. Oh, that's very, a good mentor for you. Yes. Right, yes. Were, did, were you ever in the service at all? Did you serve in the I was service? not. No. I, okay. um, uh, I, I don't know um, how old you are, Catherine, but um, uh, they're, they're the first lottery was held when I was at Purdue uh -huh. where, where they drew your birth dates out in sequence. And, and um, my draft number was 172. I did pass the physical and was um, um, 
debating whether to try to enlist in a reserve unit, decided I would take my chances, but just never got drafted. Wonderful. And, um, you and lucked, lucked out. I, I was very lucky. I had a number of friends who, uh, who served in Vietnam, and uh, fortunately all the people I knew came back safely. And obviously there were thousands of, uh, of young boys and men that didn't, but, uh, but I never got drafted. Right. So. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about your um, time on the Board of Trustees. You were appointed by Governor Bai in uh, July 1995, replacement for Emerson Cabin, and then you were reappointed yes. the following year. Yes. Uh, talk a little about uh, orientation to the Board. What sort of do they, how does that come about? Well, well, it was interesting. I'll, I'll tell you about the phone call I had from Evan uh, okay. to begin with. Steve Bearing had talked to me about this a little bit, and I was very busy and um, and was really debating whether I had time to do this. And I happened to be in Zurich, Switzerland, on, on business. I was then president of United Airlines. And Evan called me up, found me, uh, and tracked me down in a hotel in Zurich, and, and uh, I turned him down. And, and he said, well, John, I'm going to play to your ego. He said, well, a few trustees of uh, the state universities have moved out of state after they have been appointed. We have never in Purdue or IU's history appointed someone who lived out of state to join the board. So I'm trying to make you the first. And, uh, and, and my wife was also on this trip with me. She happened to be in the hotel, and the whole time she was shaking her head no as I was listening to him <laughs> give his pitch. And I finally capitulated and, and it said, you, you did play to my ego, and, and you won. Uh, and, um, and, and I have to tell you, the, the, the 10 years on the board was um, uh, a wonderful experience. It's a huge time commitment it takes just as a regular board member not nearly as much as if you're a chairman or vice chairman, but about 19 or 20 days a year. Um, and, it, and that's just while you're on campus. That doesn't include the preparation time to read the hundreds of pages that you, uh, you, you get for each board meeting. Mm -hmm. In terms of orientation, uh, what's much different about Purdue than many other colleges and universities is that it has a very small board of directors. It's much like a corporate board. Okay. Many schools will have 50 or 60 or even 70 trustees, hmm. and, and, and Purdue's is nine, uh, I believe, plus a student trustee, and, and we work really hard. It's run like a corporate board. Um, you know, we have uh, had, had uh, a, a, a vision that we all had for Purdue. The thing that I loved more than anything else about Purdue's board, and it was and I think still is different than any other state university I've ever uh, heard of, is that Purdue came first. It didn't make any difference whether you had been an appointee of a Democratic governor or a Republican governor or were an alumni elected trustee. Uh, we all had one thing in common, in common and one purpose in mind, and that was what is best for Purdue. And for the, the 10 years I was on the board, while we would have some debates as individuals when we walked into a board meeting, uh, we had agreed on what was best. And, um, and that is very unusual with, um, you know, with public institutions. Um, and, um, and I just thought it was wonderful. I never heard once um, the term Democrat or Republican uh, or anything about politics, it's always, uh, What's best for Purdue, and I think one of the one of the big reasons was is that all of us had a deep affection for the impact that Purdue had had on our lives, and we wanted that uh, that same thing to happen for thousands of other young people, and um, and so I just it was a it was a time-consuming but very personally rewarding and right. enjoyable experience. Right, nicely said. Um, one of the committees, did you serve on the fi uh, finance committee? Was yes. That, oh, is that yeah. the one you were on? Okay. And audit, uh, I think audit and insurance, and then we had an investment in finance and, uh, and different committees like that. Okay. Now, during your tenure on the board, the, um, Dr. Jeske came on board, so yes. you were involved in, with that. And as others on the board that I've uh, talked to, that 
the selection of the president of the university is the most responsible job of the board's selection. Is yes. that correct? Uh, I would agree. There's no other function we have more important than choosing right. who is going to lead the university. Right. So that was kind of kind of a and and then you came on board when Dr. Baring was there, and then you were there when Dr. Jeske took board. Right. Yes. Um, strategic plan. Uh, Tell us a little, any comment on that. Of course, you that came on board while you were there. <laughs> it, 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 uh, and, you know, we, we had a number of business people on the board, uh -huh. and, and we like to have a vision. We like to have a plan. We like to have timetables. We like to have markers on what you've achieved and what you've not yet achieved and how you're going to make things happen. And, um, and Martin... I have to say, and I've met a number of university presidents uh, over the years, is the most businesslike and professional university president I have ever encountered. In, in fact, and I've told Martin this, I just told him this about a week ago again, uh -huh. I was a little worried that he was maybe too businesslike to be successful. Uh, but, but he had a way about him of engaging people and listening to people and motivating them and getting them to move in the same direction. And um, he worked very hard and the board worked very hard um, to develop a, a, a new vision for Purdue going forward. And, um, and I, I have to be highly complimentary of him. I, I mean, he did a great job of selling that vision to the faculty and administration and students of Purdue. And, um, and I, and I think to a board member, we were just, uh, um, you know, you stumble into good decisions sometimes. You can't always take sure. credit for making the right yeah. decisions. And we that felt happens. very fortunate that uh, we found him and that he said yes. Okay. The other thing that comes to board too was the capital campaign, which. And, really and I'll tell you another okay. funny story about okay. this. When, um, when I was interviewing Martin for the job. Uh huh. Um, I, I said, Martin, um, you know, we, uh, we are becoming more and more reliant on contributions um, from alumni and, uh, and people who are interested in Purdue and less and less reliant on the state of Indiana because the funding from the state has essentially been flat for 25 or 30 years of Purdue. It's, uh, it has, it's not gone up very much. And I said, um, Nobody has ever asked me for a major gift to Purdue. I said I've given a lot of money away to other institutions in Chicago where I live and mm -hmm. uh, other national uh, not-for-profit organizations, and, and nobody from Purdue's ever really tried to get deep in my pocket. So within a week after Martin was in office, he called me back and reminded me of that conversation and said, I would like you to endow a chair in the engineering department. And so I had to say yes, because uh, uh, of the fact that I had told him that no one had ever asked. And so um, uh, he, asked. Really, he really had me in a box. Right. And, um, but Martin was, um, was, was clearly uh, the, the the biggest developer, I think, in Purdue's history in terms of capital raised, right. um, new construction on campus, hiring, you know, 300 new professors. Discovery uh, Park. Discovery wow. Park. And, yeah. and, you know, you just, you, you look at all of um, the accomplishments uh, during that period, and, and he did a great job. He sure did. That's right. Uh, a couple of committee activities. One's the master plan. Is the board uh, works on master plan? as well for the university yes okay okay and is that what uh, go on 10 years or do they make changes or I'm thinking of researchers might say how long do you, do you tweak it a little bit or or do you start all over I, That's I think right. one of the things Purdue has always I, I think been very good at long-term planning and okay. thinking about where the university wants to be what new markets it can serve what its mission is for the state of Indiana and, and, and I think that there's been a, a great awareness on, on the board uh, over the last 20 years, and this is something I firmly believe in as a, as a native Hoosier. I think it's great that Purdue is a state school, but there has been a lot of debate uh, politically within the state of Indiana about is Purdue a great Indiana school or should it be a great international school? 
and, uh, and, and from my standpoint, I always wanted Purdue to be well known internationally. I wanted the best students from all over the world to know about Purdue, and I think we've done a great job in agriculture and science and engineering and, and other fields as well in attracting uh, some of the most talented students from all over the world to come to Purdue. Uh, but but often, you know, I, I got frustrated with some of the politicians who would get, you know, parochial mm -hmm. about Purdue as a state school, and we shouldn't worry about these students from China and India and you know and, and other places. And um, I just thought that uh, all of the international students made all of the domestic students better. Mm -hmm. And we learned a lot about the world. We learned a lot about other cultures, about other political systems and religious beliefs. And um, Purdue usually, as, as you know, um, has, you know, they're either first or second in the number of foreign students on a single campus in the That's United right. States. And right. I, I think it's just very important for Purdue's future to be thinking about being a global school rather than an Indiana school. All right. Good point, yeah. Well, budget, do you people are involved in the budget, both the operating and the, and the capital as well? Yeah. And that's always, as you say, a challenge with the state and things of that sort. Well, one of the things that is true, no matter who you are doing a budget for, is there's never enough money. That's it's right. just as true. Even, with the, any, even in a home, right? <laughs> even in a home. Very, so at the true. local level. It's true at the very basic unit and <laughs> all the way up to major corporations. And so I, I, I think um, one of the things that Purdue has had over many years, and, and I can remember, uh, and I know I saw that Mary Ford was on your advisory uh, committee, and, and Fred Ford, uh -huh. I knew as a student because I was active in organizations that were funded by the university as a student and I got to know Fred when I, I believe he was controller or maybe it was called comptroller at the time, I'm not sure. Sure. And and meeting with him and I have always admired Purdue for the financial discipline that it has had and and, uh, and a lot of that is cultural, but it's not just in the financial organization. I think that almost everyone I have ever encountered that works at Purdue um, thinks about how to get the most for your investment, no matter what department they're in or what they teach. Um, it's just a school where I always feel very good about making a contribution to Purdue because I know the money will be well spent. Right. And, um, and and so I, I, I think, you know, we, we had some big decisions to make and a lot of money to spend, um, but we were always very careful about how we were doing that. Good point. Uh, a couple things on appointments. I, you, uh, some new deans came on board, I think, when you were there. Would have been, uh, what, Toby, Toby Parcell for liberal arts? And uh, was Jeff Bitter for science, and then uh, uh, John Pruzo for nursing and health sciences. And right, pharmacy. and a new provost as well after Martin. And um, right. one of the things I, I felt, uh, you know, I was always a little worried. How do we attract a really talented person to live in West Lafayette, Indiana, mm -hmm. when they could be in Boston or they could be in Southern California or, or you know, or other locations? But what was always neat is that we got the person that we wanted to say yes. And, um, and I think there um, is something unusual about Purdue. Um, and I, I think it's culture. I, I think it's how people work with each other. Um, but we always were able to attract very talented people to come to the school. And, uh, and, you know, as a corporate leader, you always worry about being able to do that, and you know the location is important. Sure. So you try to build offices or factories or warehouses and places where you can track the type of people that you want. Right. Um, but Purdue is in West Lafayette, <laughs> and that's yeah, where it's always going to be based. Right. And obviously there are regional campuses, but... Um, we did very well recruiting very talented people. All right. And also, uh, even when for the library, you, you're close to Chicago and you're close to Indianapolis, and it, you know, you've got the best of both worlds. And there's just a lot of, and then you've got Bloomington for a lot of the music things. So there's just a lot. The cultural environment is very good. 
It really is. I agree. And and the the other thing that the I always enjoyed. athletics, of course. What? <laughs> yeah. The, the, the other thing I always enjoyed is um, are the the kinds of of musicians and artists and politicians sure. that would come to Purdue. Right. Um, and uh, and as a student, if you wanted to become exposed to what was going on in the world, you could do it at West Lafayette. That's because right. Because people came from all over the world to Purdue. Right, exactly. Good point. A couple of other things. Some of the buildings that came on, uh, one was the computer science and the visual and performing arts, and of course, the Armstrong, you know, was sort of underway or whatever when you were on the board. Is that correct? Yes. And the biomedical one, too. Yeah. And the naming of the buildings has changed a little bit, isn't it? Years ago, you had to be dead before they <laughs> named you. Yeah, you know, I think uh, a, lot, a lot of buildings were uh, memorials or in Maybe. memoriam. Um, and, uh, <laughs> they and, were gone uh, and they couldn't benefit by it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Oh. Yeah, and often the buildings were named by the state, and that was okay. be before the days of people contributing money to okay. um, you know to build buildings and that started changing in the 60s and 70s and then then became much more significant um, right. and clearly the Armstrong building was, was important I mean uh, how much more proud could we be to have the the first man on the moon be a Purdue engineer That's and right. um, and the last man on the moon uh, Gene Cernan is That's also right. a Purdue engineer so um, I, I, I think that um, naming that building for uh, for Neil was a, a great um, uh, recognition uh, because of all the visibility that, that he brought to Purdue. Right, exactly. And I, isn't it interesting, you know, with that archway that uh, the class of 58 and 59, he's looking in that direction. Yeah. And when they're yep. so it just works out really nice. <laughs> it does. Uh, no, um, it's very neat. Right. The... Um, d Diversity was another thing that uh, the board also, as long as as well as the university, is involved in too, as well. With that. You know, I, I, it's something that I think we have yet to solve the way I would like to see it solved. I um, uh, remember recruiting uh, to join the um, uh, Phi Gamma Delta fraternity, uh -huh. a, a, a freshman during I think I was a junior. Um, his name was Daryl Stingley, and you oh, may remember his oh, name. Yes. He was a great oh, football player. Wonderful, and oh. and and, um, and, and An he unfortunate accepted. fall happened. Yeah, to exactly. Him. And he accepted, um, you know, became a pledge, and had such pressure put on him by the African American fraternities that he he walked away and joined an African American fraternity, and and I understood that, um, and yet. I, I think people have worked so hard, and we still, not just between African Americans and, and, and others, um, but between international students as well. It was a big focus of the board while I was on the board, and uh -huh. something in which I had a great deal of interest. Um, Maimon Powers was at Purdue when when I was at Purdue, and, and uh, we didn't know each other there, but we became you know really good uh, partners at the board. Mm -hmm. and. And, and Maimon just really was very helpful in trying to help us figure out how to be more inclusive, but also encourage inclusiveness. And it, it's still not as good as I want it to be. I doubt it's as good as any of the current board members want it to be. Um, and, um, and and it's, uh, you know, it's something that I, I think we've improved upon but we're still not home yet. Yeah, right. They're still working on it. That's yes. what it's kind of thing. Alumnus, giving back. You mentioned about that chair. That's very nice. And the first recipient was Linda Katechi. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what? one of the things that just happened to be that we were looking for a new dean of engineering uh -huh. and obviously to recruit uh, the best possible person we could, uh, it's important to have an endowment to go along with that, uh, mostly not to fund their pay, but to help fund the research that they want to do, and they don't want to quit doing research when uh, they they become a dean and move completely into sure. administrative work, and so um, that was part of the package. And and from my standpoint, um, uh, I was the the first person in my family to get a college degree, and that Purdue engineering degree. I, I, I really use it every day. I, I mean, I, I, I think there are things, particularly the scientific method of problem solving, 
that just became so ingrained in me at Purdue mm -hmm. that I go through the same thought process on solving problems today. So I've always felt that um, I got a lot from Purdue and I owe a lot to Purdue and uh, so I should be uh, generous uh, where possible to, to give back. Very nice. Another thing that uh, you've been appointed by President Cordova to the Purdue Foundation Development Council. Yes, and uh, so that's trying to convince other people to do what I've done, and I enjoy <laughs> doing that. I, I like asking people to support Purdue, Good. And, uh, and it's uh, fun to do and important to do. All right. How about family? You talk, um, do, you have, do you have any of your children come here to Purdue? Uh, none of them did, and, okay. and I think it was very interesting. When my three daughters were going through college, for some strange reason, they didn't want to be on a college campus where their dad was going to be showing up every month and where everyone knew that he was a trustee. So I was very disappointed that, um, that none of them came to Purdue, but I can also kind of understand sure. from from their point of view, they, they may have wanted a little distance in. So they're, they're all graduates, too, with advanced degrees, but uh -huh. I couldn't get any of them to uh, to go to Purdue. Well, they just come to the events, and that's, that's key would, anyway. Yes. Right. Yep. Now, your career path, of course, you're currently um, with CEO of CDW, right? Yes. What type, can you tell for the research, sure. what type of yeah, company? Sure. Yeah, CDW is a computer hardware and software um, uh, distributor we sell for companies like Hewlett Packard and Microsoft and Cisco and IBM, our revenues are um, about $8.7 billion, so we're a fairly large company. We mm -hmm. operate in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, we're only 27 years old, so okay. we, uh, we're a fairly young company and started uh, in kind of the new age of technology. Um, and our customers are primarily businesses and governments, and, and so we're um, only about 1% consumer, and everything else is uh, B to B and B to G. Okay, sounds good. All right. Awards and honors. When you stepped down from the award, there was a nice resolution for uh, your distinguished service. And the other thing, another award that you got was the DEA. Yes, and, and um, you know, bo both of these are, are hanging on walls in, in my um, office. Uh, I, I'm very proud of those. Right. I, I think that, um, um, you know, it, it's, uh, again, I, I think the award is more recognition of what Purdue enabled me to do than anything else. Had I not gone to Purdue and learned what I did, um, I, I, I think my life would have been completely different than it turned out to be. Well, that's very. How did you find out about the DEA? Did uh, someone call you? Sometimes I ask people that, and they, they have different varieties in how they learn about. Um, you know, I, I, I think it was probably Martin that called me about okay. that. I'm not sure. Uh -huh. And um, and more more than likely it was. And. Uh, obviously is something that you can never ask for you know if it happens it happens and if it doesn't it doesn't but it's not That's something right. you go you go knock on the door and say well you do i'm this. ready so, right <laughs> yeah exactly well industrial engineering you've been involved with the uh, that school as well haven't you yes uh -huh. um you know the the school when i uh was at purdue was always ranked uh, in the top two or three industrial engineering schools in uh -huh. the country and a, and a number of us uh, from the, the years I was at Purdue are still very active with the School of Industrial Engineering um, and it's still very highly rated which is important to all of us and, and so we want to make sure that it continues to be one of the top two or three industrial engineering schools in the country and, and, um, and it still is on an undergraduate basis. We'd like to get it back there on a graduate school basis as well. And so it used to be always number one or two. It slipped a little bit, and so we're working hard to try to get it back in that top position. Okay, sounds good. Uh, I'm going to ask a couple things. Favorite Purdue tradition? Do you have one? You can have more you than know, one. Um, I, I, well, I guess it's got to be around sports. Uh, when, when I was there, we had incredibly good basketball and football teams. I, I, the, the fraternity I lived in had swimmers. Um, Morgan Burke, uh, who's now the athletic director, was my little brother in the fraternity. Oh, my goodness. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and we had baseball players and football players. And, um, and so I just loved sports. And... Um, 
Uh, one of the things I, I really like now is the Big Ten channel because I can't mm -hmm. get down to Purdue as often as I would like to, but now if I cannot, I can watch the basketball game or the football games right. on the Big Ten channel, which is really great. It sure is. That's right. Yes. How about an outstanding event? You um, can have more than one. You can you know, have more than uh, one. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I still, there are a couple of things that um, I remember and, and um uh, Catherine, I don't know how long you've been around Purdue, but the, the biggest demonstration in Purdue's history happened, I believe, my junior year at Purdue, uh -huh. when tuition was raised from $200 a semester to $400 a semester. And this was right in the middle of the Vietnamese War, and I can remember seeing a couple thousand students marching around campus because of the price increase, and yet it was the most orderly demonstration. So this was when crazy things were happening at okay. Berkeley and Wisconsin and Kent State mm -hmm. and yet the students of Purdue wanted to be heard but they did it in a very peaceful gentlemanly or gentlewomanly way and, sure. and I think that just says a lot about the types of people that come to Purdue and and uh, it's kind of an unusual thing to remember but I just remember the contrast of what happened at Purdue versus what happened at other schools in, in the late 60s. Yeah, interesting point. Um, goal, I was going to ask you, goal setting as a, uh, an employee or an executive, would you make a comment on that and also leadership in the profession? I have, uh, one of the things I learned both at Purdue and then I follow Purdue with an MBA at the University of Chicago, as uh -huh. we mentioned, and goal setting was something that I I, I just kind of learned, I guess, in college. Uh -huh. And I came out of college um, uh, and, and for many, many years had a five-year plan and a one-year plan and a one-month plan. And I worked this way for probably 30 years. And, and um, uh, once I got to be a, um, a company president, I didn't quite do that as much. I still had plans for the company. Um, but not as, as much for me as an individual. Sure. And, um, and I try to broaden those plans over the years from being just a business oriented to being um, family and children oriented a little bit. I, I traveled a lot when I was young um, in business and, um, and uh, you know, I've had a number of conversations with my three girls about that, about, you know, how, how often I was gone. Yet they all know that my business success has enabled them to do things they never would have been able to do, and um, and and so there's always a trade-off there. But I have always been a very goal-oriented individual. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, uh, is there something that I forgot to ask, or anything uh, that you'd like to elaborate, or in closing, whatever? I leave it up to you. Well, I, I think as I, uh, I look back at the relationship that I've had with Purdue and continue to have, it's been um, a long time since I drove to Purdue my senior year in high school with a fellow student from Harrison High to take a look at Purdue and, 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 uh, and make that decision. Um, Frankly, it was the only school I could afford to go to to get an engineering degree. And fortunately, one of the best engineering schools in the world was um, was in Indiana right. and, uh, and affordable. So I, I think one of the things that's important to me is, well, I want Purdue to be recognized around the world. I also want it to be affordable for Indiana students to be able to attend. And um, so... I, I think it's important for all of us as alumni to try to help do what we can do to continue to offer scholarships and, and financial aid to promising young people who may not be able to afford Purdue on their own. Right. Very nice. Thank you very much. That's well, very Well, you nice. are welcome. And, and, uh, and tell me just a little bit, uh, we can kind of go off air if you want to, no. about, I'll, about I'll, your I'll board. Just and, you and I'll, I'll take off the recorder. We can just chat for a couple yeah. minutes after you.